hello everyone and welcome. This is Aurora with Central Coast Astronomical Society. It's good to see you, hello. We are gonna have an, a really fun stargazing show for you tonight. And before we get started, I we have, uh, actually it's at the top of the hour. I was gonna say we have a few minutes to talk, but apparently we don't, so we have to actually get started. Okay, so <laughs> for tonight, we get to do some stargazing. We, we have a couple of different, um, different objects we're gonna take a look at. Before I bring on our astronomer who's going to be sharing those stargazing views with you, I just want to make sure you are set up for tonight. Um, you don't need anything. I do recommend a pencil and a piece of paper just in case we say something and you're like, ooh, that sounds cool. I want to remember that. So you can just jot it down really quickly. Um, for tonight, you don't need anything special. Our goal with our uh, stargazing tonight is to share enough information with you so you can go outside as long as the weather's cooperating, <laughs> go outside, look up, know where to look and also understand what it is you're looking at. So that's our goal for you tonight. And so we're going to have some fun. Um, you're going to get learned. You can ask any questions you like. We have a number of astronomers that are on in the chat that are answering questions as we go through our objects for tonight. Now, before we actually get started, I have I have this set up on another screen, so let me share it with you. If you're new to stargazing, you may not know about this. Um, Brian, if you want to drop the link in the chat for YouTube, that would be helpful because I forgot. Um, <laughs> so we have a sky map that is available. This is available for free, and if you've never used one of these before, they can be pretty intimidating. <laughs> so what I recommend is we are going to go look at four different objects tonight, and I'm going to show you where that is so you can use a highlighter or circle it or something so you kind of know how this looks, how this goes. And then on the other side is the celestial object. So this is what's up in the in the night sky and they print these out for every month. So this one is December and they're again they're free and you're welcome to use those as well. So when we do our stargazing we're going to be looking through a telescope. We have a, a telescope that's attached to the computer. Ryan has that and he's going to share it'd be like just you going up and looking through his telescope. <laughs> so he's hooked up the computer so you can see it. In addition I'm going to be showing you my screen. So step by step I'm going to show you where things are in the night sky. So you, again you'll know where it is and, and, and so forth when we do that together. So it should be really fun. Right now, if you can get your fingers on a keypad of some kind and tell me where it is in the world that you are connecting from, astronomically speaking, that'll help us out. You can let us know uh, where you are so we can also um, be sure to mention things that are in your area. So, <laughs> yay! Um, if you have telescope or binocular questions or equipment questions, we usually save those for the end. And so, um, yeah, so it's good to see you, I know. <laughs> so we've had, uh, we, uh, Central Coast Astronomy has also had a live in-person events every single um, month so far. And so if you've been viewing those instead of the online ones, we, we've really enjoyed seeing you there as well. And so we've been at the lake observing about once a month when the weather permits and which is really fun. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So I think that was enough of an intro. What do you think, Brian? Was that good? I think that's an excellent intro. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and bring Brian on with me. So hello, Brian. Hello, Aurora. <laughs> hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here today. Awesome. So Brian, what kind of telescope are we looking through tonight? So this is a Celestron 8-inch telescope called a C8. Okay. <laughs> the type of telescope is the Smith Cassegrain. Mm -hmm. And then instead of a eyepiece where we would normally look with our eyes, I have a special astronomy camera hooked up there. Mm -hmm. That astronomy camera, for those who want to know, is from a company called ZWO, and it's an ASI 2600. And I, it's basically just like a digital SLR camera, digital camera, but without all the camera body and everything, the telescope is my lens instead of <laughs> attaching lenses like you might with a regular telescope. Awesome. Okay, great. And so, um, Brian, what is the first object we're going to be looking at tonight? The and how do you want to do this? Do you want me yeah, to show I it think, first or so do you the, want to? Let's show how to find it and okay. then, at least with this one, and then because I have it ready. Oh, okay. But then... Uh, We'll, um, in fact, since I have it ready, Why don't you, let's actually show it. Let's just show it. Let me, let me flip to you okay. directly so okay. you have full control then, now. Awesome. And I will share my screen. Okay. So our first object for tonight is Albireo. And this is uh, not a nebula or a planet. This is actually, from our naked eye, would look like a star. But it's fun because it's actually a double star. 
And this is my native view with the camera right now. And hopefully even right now you can see it has two very distinctive colors. And you know, with our naked eyes, it's rare to be able to see color um, in, in a lot of these deep sky objects because our eyes simply are not sensitive enough. But with Albireo, you can. Uh, even a small telescope, you can point right at Albireo and we'll show you how to find it. And you can see this very distinctive, often described as gold and blue. So I'll go ahead and share some of the uh, facts that I have about Albireo. Yes. Okay, now, um, as we're going to show you here in the Stellarium program soon, this is at the very tail of Cygnus the Swan, also an asterism often called the Northern Cross. What's interesting is when you look at this through a telescope, we might first think it's a binary system. Binary is when the two stars are officially orbiting each other. Think Tatooine <laughs> for that, a system with two suns. But they're actually an optical double. In other words, it's just a chance alignment. These two stars are not gravitationally connected to each other um, and are actually about 30 light years away from each other. <laughs> um, Albireo A is considered the gold star, and it's a red supergiant, about five times the mass of our sun. And it's considered to be 430 light years away. Coming up a little bit closer than the blue star, is about 400 light years away. Now we can tell a star's temperature by its color and the blue blue is actually hotter. So this is hotter than its companion and um, but it is considered to be a main sequence star. In other words, it's still happily fusing, make sure I say this right, fusing hydrogen to make helium just like our sun is. But this star, the blue one is considered to be about 2.7 times the mass of our sun. Um, something else that's interesting is going back to the gold star. Uh, it sounds funny when I say gold star. It's like students getting an award. Like you get a gold star. Well, <laughs> Albireo here, <laughs> this A, Albireo A as it's called, is actually, think some scientists think it's a quadruple star system. So take out the whole blue star completely and we're talking about just Albireo A, some scientists think it's actually four stars orbiting each other. And they've given them designations, Albireo A, A, and then B, C, and D. <laughs> the problem is no one can find what they're considered B. They think it's super, super close to where they can't find any instrument that can separate the two stars from each other. So, so far, Albireo A is officially three stars, but with our regular day-to-day -day telescopes, we cannot separate those three stars from each other. So for us, we get to enjoy Albireo as a optical double, and it's a wonderful object to go and see where we can actually see some color, some color through a telescope. All right. Awesome. And well, let's, um, yeah, you can really see the color yeah. difference. And when you come up to a telescope, that's really what it looks like. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's really fun, you know, where oftentimes we're seeing faint fuzzies and things like that to see just two sharp stars with distinct mm -hmm. different colors. It's really a treat. I find. Testing and yes. You know, what's um, one question that I can imagine hap happening, I don't see it here, but um, is can you see this with binoculars? And that's a good question. They would have to be big binoculars. Um, the research that I did showed that that it was expected to need a magnification of at least 30 times. So, okay. yeah, so I think the biggest, I, what are your, your, your binoculars? Are they? Yeah, I can see it with a 25 by 100s. 25. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, they're big. <laughs> yeah, they're big and pulling in a lot of light, <laughs> right? Pulling Just as a, a, a tip for everybody. When you're looking at binoculars, there's two numbers. I think, are yours 25 by 100s? Yeah. You said? So yeah. 25 would be the magnification, mm -hmm. and 100 is the aperture or the opening at the front of the binoculars. Yeah. Here's, um, if you stop sharing your screen, I'll hold these up real Absolutely. quick. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and then uh, then we can show how to find this. Yes, and then I have okay. that up here as well. my Zoom okay. controls. So what we were saying, most people have binoculars like this. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> what Brian's talking about is these are 7, um, 7x50. So 7 by 50 is how they're pronounced. But the 7, the X goes with the 7. So it means you're looking through. So whatever appears like 1 inch, when you look through here, it's 7 inches. It appears 7 times larger. And then the 50 is the millimeter size of where the light comes in. And so that's how you... Um, that's how that's one of the specifications for binoculars and 7x 50s are, are fine and it's it, they're not too heavy and the perfect binoculars for you are the ones you're going to use so <laughs> these are good to use um, okay so let me show you um, actually I have it here and then I'm going to take you to my program Stellarium so if you printed out sky maps Cygnus is right here um, and we're going to be looking right there at Alberio it's even labeled Alberio right there and so Cygnus is a swan and it looks like this and I'm going to show you this in just just a second here on my screen which is right here okay so when we look up in the night sky it often looks like this <laughs> lots of little dots <laughs> and it's hard to know well where do we look <laughs> okay so Brian how would you um, do you want to talk me through this like I, sure. I think most people can find this one Oh, yes. Yes, always a distinctive <laughs> constellation when you look up. Every every winter, I, I glance over to Orion. It's like, that is a big constellation. Yeah, so this is one <laughs> we're going to get to later tonight. You can tell with the three bright belt stars. makes it real easy to see. This is on the complete opposite side than the side we're going to be looking at. Yes. <laughs> so if yeah, you see I this see... one, turn around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look more towards the, uh, the move towards the south. I guess I would almost say north. Um, Northwest, yeah. And really, what you're doing is you're looking still for the summer triangle, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Even though we're into into autumn, getting ready for winter, and you want to look for those bright three bright stars of the summer triangle. It'd be Vega, go. Deneb, and Altair. Yep. Oh, you know what? I can leave the labels on. Okay. So, um, so your bright stars are here. You can see this one. Yeah. There's uh, one, Altair, right? two, and three. And what's really cool is if you look carefully, I, is my cursor coming through? Yes, I, I can see it at least on Zoom and oh, I can okay, see great. it on YouTube as well. Perfect. Okay, great. And so if we draw here, let me turn the labels off now. So what we're looking for is these three that make a triangle. So basically, if you go outside and look west, this red W, if you can see it, stands for west. You basically look west. It's real low in the horizon right now, tonight and this week and for the next couple of weeks. And you'll be able to see three really bright stars, even if you live in a big, bright city. Uh, as long as you can see the horizon, you'll still be able to see these are really bright stars. So what you're going to do is one of these stars has a line of stars that goes through the other two. Now, you may, may not be able to see that in the city, but um, it's got a line. And then you've also got another line across. And if we draw in the symbol of Cygnus the Swan, you can see what we're talking about. So here are the wings, and here's the beak, and the eye of Cygnus is Alberio right there. Yes, which uh, uh, James on, on the chat corrected me. I said it was the tail but it's actually the head. Oh no, the tail <laughs> is Deneb, which is, yes. is it Arabic or Latin? I don't know which, which <laughs> language, but for duck butt is what it actually means. <laughs> <laughs> I got that from Kent. Um, and so the ones you wanna look right here. So this is Cygnus and we're looking right here. And this is a star that's between these two really bright ones. So this one's Vega and this one's Altair. Okay. So great, awesome. so we can find it. So if um, if we were gonna do a little quiz, all right, let's go for a walk. You guys wanna go for a walk for me with me outside? All right, so let's go for a walk. Do, 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 do. All right, we're looking south. Okay, that's not right. <laughs> so let's turn towards, okay, there's Orion. You can see he's gonna be much bigger in your sky, about like that big. Okay, and east, okay, so we wanna go west. Okay, look west. Can you find me the three bright stars? Yeah, you see them? One, two, three. Okay, now which star are you going to look at? Where's the eye of Cygnus? If I make it a little bigger, maybe that's a little easier for you. Okay, so Cygnus is going to be here and here, and so the eye is going to be right in there. So if I, again, put up the picture and put up the little sticks, you can see it there. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, perfect. Yes. So what else should we look at tonight, Brian? 
I think that we should go towards the Andromeda Galaxy next. Oh, and, this is a good uh, one. Do you want me to show so, where it is, or do you want to? Yes, let's there? show where it is first because my I'm still plate solving. Okay. So my telescope is. <laughs> is You're gonna correcting. tell us what that word means, yes? Yes. At, at some point, okay. So let's. Whoops, wrong screen. Okay, great. So a lot of people can find the Big Dipper pretty easily. So let's zoom out a little bit so we can see more of the sky, and then you're gonna tell me when. Let's see, when you can see it. What if I put it really big on the screen? Does that help? <laughs> okay, so we've see? got Ursa Major. Yep, so we have Ursa Major, and the part that most people recognize are the seven real bright stars here. And then this one, just to do a little bit, because I know we've done this before, if you connect these two stars and you go straight till you get to another bright star, this is the handle of the Little Dipper, which you can see here. You can see if we connect them. Here's the seven bright stars I was just pointing to. You connect these two and go straight on. And this is the Little Dipper to kind of get you oriented in the night sky. So we always like to start with stuff that we know, and that's one that a lot of people can find. All right, so from here, where should we go, Brian? What do you think? So let's see. Sorry, I was just adjusting. My, oh, no, no, that's okay. I can keep talking. Okay. If you want me to. Yeah, Marista, I'm looking for the W. So. It looks like, so you have horizon turned off. It's funny. So there's Hercules. Hercules is actually just about set here now. I'll put the horizon back in. How's that? <laughs> is that better? <laughs> yeah. So I would head a little more uh, towards the, the east. Okay. So Ruga right there. And these programs yep, are So there we are. So we have Perseus. Yep. So there it is. Yeah. Cassiopeia. And okay. even though, of course, the Andromeda galaxies and Andromeda often start from Cassiopeia, and um, which would be looking, depending on the time of the year, either a three or a like a weird E. Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, I just kind of threw the Big Dipper in there because people can find it. Okay, so let's get serious yeah. now. So, <laughs> so if we look for the the W, you can see it's here or an M or a 3 depending on how it's oriented. You're going you see how there's two triangles? Here's a larger one and here's a smaller one. You take that larger one and it's pointing to three stars. One, two, three. That first star right on and usually you, you, we don't see these. We see this big one right here first and then we back up one, two. So the third so we have a bright star that's one and then the second star and third, and right there you can actually see Andromeda, which is right here. So if we were to turn off all the handy labels, okay, and shake it up a little bit, there we go. Okay, so here, let me make Andromeda disappear. <laughs> okay, so do you see how this is the W or the M? Okay, so we take the larger of the two, here's the shallower one, we use that for something else. Here's the larger one, and it's pointing to three bright stars kind of in a little curve, so here's one, and then two and three. And right at the end of this one is where you want to look. Start scanning with your binoculars. This is the only galaxy that is observable from the northern hemisphere with the naked eye if you have good seeing conditions. Your skies are clear, the skies are nice and dark, and you're miles from any lights. Um, you'll be able to see a smudge with your eyeballs, especially if you're on the younger side. <laughs> All right, so Brian, I yes. shouldn't have showed this picture, huh? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's okay. There's a big difference between a processed Hubble image <laughs> and, yes. and a live one. All right, awesome. Okay, yeah, so I, have... I will throw it back to you. You ready? Okay, great. Yep, let me share my go. screen here. And so this is the live image then of the Andromeda galaxy. And to to give you some, I'm, I'm still collecting images. Um, so to give you while we're looking at this i'm still going to be adjusting as we go but to give you a definition for that term i used plate solving mm -hmm. um, that actually comes back from the days when they did photography on glass plates when they would would actually photograph the night sky and they would start to literally measure the distance of the stars and start to build very detailed charts well nowadays we have very sophisticated databases of star locations and in fact the european mission gaia is really beefing up that database so what happens is when i take an image i can actually tell my program to plate solve which literally takes a picture and then compares it to a database of star images and their locations 
it will figure out what my picture is actually showing and then it knows because it asks the telescope it'll say to the telescope what do you think you're looking at and it compares that to the picture and it will literally give the correction to the telescope and allow it to center the object i asked for so when i first took the my first image before i plate solved andromeda was far over to the left uh, in the image but then after the solving now it's nice and centered and so now that it's centered then what I've done is I'm using a feature called stacking where we're combining 30 second images and the computer's combining them to give us more and more detail while taking out some of the noise, so to speak. Uh, so, so far I have uh, five, little over five minutes worth of exposure time here. To show you what it'll look like without any settings, if I just put it down here um, and reset everything, then this is the faint fuzzy, a little more like what we might look at through binoculars, but then I can start to enhance it by bring stretch. We call this stretching the image. And this allows us to bring in more detail. And then I can also do color correction, which helps, helps me get away a little bit of the color bias. So this one, one of the adventures from where I am at is looking in this direction i have the glow of a city and that's evident <laughs> in the glow that we're seeing here just <laughs> over the whole picture and in, that looks in amazing and my, my software i um processing it after the fact then i could actually bring out a lot of this glow but on a live image there's not a whole lot i can do the, at least from what i'm aware what i know to do in this program <laughs> uh Let's see, let's check for any questions. Any questions coming um, up on the chat? No, but we're getting requests. <laughs> okay, yeah, I saw the request. I, I saw one request for the Beehive Galaxy, but I, I asked for a, um, yes. a, a, a number on that. So I'm... <laughs> um, yeah, I got so... a request to show where it is on the paper map. So you tell okay. me when you're done yeah. and I'll do that. Well, let me, let me go ahead and give it back to you. Oh, okay. And then I'll see if I can clean up the image a little bit more than I'll... Okay, I'll let great. you know. And let's go ahead and take a look. So on your paper, if you've got that, um, where you remember before I was showing you the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper? So here's the Big Dipper, and it even says to Polaris, the North Star, right there. There's that line I was showing you how to draw to the Little Dipper. For me, when I'm stargazing, if I can see the Big Dipper, then I'm going to continue and then uh, move a little bit this way and then I'll see Cassiopeia. But Cassiopeia is usually pretty easy to find on its own. So that's your first um, that's your first signpost that you're going to be looking for. You're going to take that large triangle and it points towards Andromeda, the constellation Andromeda itself. And then we are going to be looking, let's see if it has, this is M31. This is the, the image that we are looking for. And so the galaxy we're looking for, which is right there. Okay, so find Cassiopeia and then just go straight to those three, one, two, three, and there they are. And that third star doesn't look like it's written on this star map, but you'll be able to see it. Okay, good. All right, um, other questions that came in. Uh, we love your questions, so please, by all means, yes, um, pepper us with questions. We have lots of happy astronomers that love questions. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I did have a request to, uh, for a little more information about uh, my telescope. Okay. So um, let me sh I'm gonna share my screen again because yeah, I, me... I was able to clean up contrast a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, and so here oh, I've wow. been able to get some more of the dark lanes in here. And we have one of the companion galaxies here of Andromeda. Andromeda has at least 14 known dwarf galaxies orbiting around it. Uh, the two most famous are actually two Messier objects, N110 and M32. And this is, um, this is one of them, I believe this one is M32. I'm open to corrections, if not. Uh, one looks like an oval, one looks like more elliptical, but you know, without me pulling in more detail, and uh, it's upside down how you, we normally see it. But uh, a little more about my telescope. So this is a, a normal, we might say, Celestron uh, C8 telescope. This originally had a fork mount, which is the classic ones you'd see with a hand controller. And I actually modified it with what's called a dovetail that allows me to slide it onto a more sophisticated mount, let's say. So my my mount, which is what drives the telescope, is from a company called Ioptron. It's the um, uh, CEM70, 
which means it can handle 70 pounds worth of equipment. And with that, it allows me to track the night sky and it rotates the telescope with the night sky as well. It's uh, called the German equatorial somewhat, but it's, it's actually, uh, well, I won't get into the details, but how it works, it's, it stays nice and balanced, I find, throughout the night. And that telescope then is connected to my computer that's sitting out in the cold <laughs> on a table. And by... Um, by using this program, SharpCap, then it's receiving the images from the camera. And then what I do is I'm using a program called Starry Night. So this is my view. And with Starry Night, in fact, if I rotate this around, it tells me there. So it tells me where the telescope is currently pointed. And I can go and plan out my other objects and it will show the little red X moving across the map as the telescope moves. And so by between these two programs, that allows me to capture these images and then I can go from, from object to object. Awesome. Okay, okay great. so um, um, we did have, we had a question about the distance for Andromeda. Yes. And, and so Andromeda is about 2.5 million light years away. So the, the light that we're seeing now left that, that long ago. Uh, something interesting, it was originally called the Great Andromeda Nebula. When uh, scientists first started to document these uh, objects in the night sky, they didn't have an understanding of separate, what we now might call island universes. They thought everything was in our own, let's say, galaxy in a local area. So any of the fuzzies they saw, they called nebula, and nebulae being the plural. But uh, it was Hubble, amongst others, who did work to prove and show that this is actually a completely separate galaxy from our own. And so you'll still see some galaxies have the name Nebula in them because it's held on. Uh, but then uh, also it's considered to have between 200 and 400 billion stars. And then, as I mentioned, there's at least... 14 dwarf galaxies orbiting around it also. So let's see, I'm looking to see if we have any other questions. I think, I think we're caught up. Have you seen any other questions? Um, no, I think I was checking the email. Sometimes people email okay. in questions. Yeah. Um, we'll handle the, the email question. I see, uh, we have some equipment questions that got emailed in. Okay. Okay. So, but yeah, let, let's keep going. We have two more objects, gotcha. is that right? We do. Um, before we do that, I was thinking I could give my little presentation yes. on the Roman Space Telescope. Please. And so let me go ahead and, and set up my screen to be able to share that properly. Okay. And then we'll go to do that. As a NASA Solar System Ambassador, I like to be able to provide a, a presentation on a mission. And I, I try to pick missions that aren't necessarily in the news. So I decided I wasn't going to do anything with um, the Artemis mission. <laughs> All the major news agencies have picked that up. Um, but Nancy Grace Roman is, is far enough away where I found it hasn't been covered a lot. Okay. There we go. So I've got my shares going here and then I just need to find my zoom controls. So let's talk about this. This we're going to talk about the Nancy Grace Roman space telescope. And this is a mission that's upcoming. So it has not launched yet. And what, what happens often with NASA missions is they'll start out with an acronym and then they'll name the mission after a scientist or notable individual uh, as the mission progresses. So originally this was called the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope or WFIRST. But now it is named the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. And here with the picture on the right, you can actually see Nancy Grace Roman and where she's in 1965, she's explaining the Advanced Orbiting Solar Observatory to astronaut Buzz Aldrin. So this is a picture of Nancy Grace Roman with Buzz Aldrin. And uh, she's she was actually the, uh, she is uh, Nancy's first chief astronomer, who's a woman, and also known as the mother of Hubble. Mm -hmm. Now on the left then, 
this would be the actual uh, concept drawing for the mission for the probe as it's designed and as they're actually building it now. Now, uh, in fact, let me advance my screens here. This is an image of the telescope in progress from 2019. One of the things that's interesting is, is they actually tracked down an extra mirror that was originally intended to be a part of some spy satellite that never actually got made, as I understand it. This mirror that will be in the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope is actually the same size as Hubble's at 2.4 meters. And so imagine mine is right, eight inches and so way less than a meter, of course, <laughs> this is going to be 2.4 meters in diameter. But unlike the Hubble telescope, poor Hubble, which this course has been up, what, I think more than 30 years, this telescope will pack a 300 megapixel camera. So it's going to be able to take images 100 times greater than Hubble. So uh, lots of scientists very eager to get this mission up and in orbit. This is a, a, a basic diagram showing you the main pieces of this uh, mission. Now, it's scheduled to launch in uh, October 2026, between there and May 2027. So we still have a few years to go. They're actually still making it right now. The primary mission uh, for this will be the to help determine the nature of dark energy, which is still a mystery to scientists. But... Um, even though, of course, the dark energy scientists are very eager for that part of the mission, but there's many other scientists, exoplanet scientists to be exact, who are excited about another feature. You, you'll notice down here it has a coronagraph instrument plotted or planned, I should say. The coronagraph will actually be able to look at distant stars and block the light from the star itself allowing direct imaging of exoplanets, an exoplanet being an object that's orbiting another star other than our own. So they're really looking forward to have the first direct images uh, of exoplanets with this uh, other instrument that's on this mission. Now, uh, to give you just a little bit more information, or, or actually I have one more slide to show, and that would be the main website. It's roman.gsfc.nasa.gov. And one of the interesting things, I definitely encourage you to go and take a look at this website. They actually have an interactive diagram that looks very similar to this, except you can zoom in and click on, on different features of this mission and the probe itself of the telescope and learn more about all of its different capabilities. And we'll definitely be watching for this launch and for the first images that come from this mission as well. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop my share here. So that's what I had to say about the, the Nancy, and often, by the way, often it's called the Roman Space Telescope for short. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, so uh, I see Jay Garcia asked on the chat, is the Roman telescope better than James Webb? Mm -hmm. And I would not call it better. I personally would say it's different. It has different mission parameters. It's different job. Uh, so, um, you know, with, with the James Webb telescope, its job is to see, as I understand it, into the deep infrared. Um, this instrument is designed to have a very wide field as its primary instrument but then also have the coronagraph so they're they're very different telescopes but both of these are better than hubble if we're if we're frank but even of course hubble though sees into the visible where uh, james webb can't so with a lot of these missions they designed them to overlap a little bit but then bring in new capabilities not to mention the new technologies that they bring to bear being decades <laughs> later in, in life. Um, and let's see. Oh, are there, um, do we have a telescope club is in Central California? <laughs> yes, we do. That would We're be Central it. Coast Astronomical <laughs> or Central Coast Astronomy. Yes, that's us. <laughs> yep, you can stargaze with us live and uh, like this and also in person. <laughs> so you can go to centralcoastastronomy.org. 
Okay, Brian, thank Definitely. you so, so much. It's neat yes. to hear about these space missions because there's oh, so many. Cool. I think there's one or two new ones between <laughs> now and like 2050. Yes, and, and of course, they're still working on new missions. What's going to happen as well, not only with James Webb, but then once the, once the Roman Space Telescope is up, then they'll make a discovery, textbooks get rewritten, <laughs> and then they get thinking, you know what we really need is a mission that does this. Yes. And then, then they get started. <laughs> so what happens is, uh, just so everyone is aware, um, Every 10 years, they have what's called a decadal survey for a decade survey. And that's where they assess what do we know, what do we need to know. Mm -hmm. And they take, for instance, the scientists take input from all over the world so that they can decide where limited resources will be applied. And I, I shared um, a link for the Nancy uh, Grace Roman. You can just click on that, and it's got all oh, the details yes, about the it, launch dates, what it looks like, what, what instrumentation. So you can go look at that as well. Yes. Uh, and the, the planned launch is between uh, 2026 and 2027. And, yeah. and uh, if Plus we could say some things about planned launches and delays, James Webb. <laughs> <laughs> so that's we, what we, we won't mention that at all. <laughs> right, not at all. No. Um, I'd like to share my screen one more time. Yes, please. I've got some much better contrast okay. before I move my telescope with uh, M31. Oh, okay, great. So, so if you've just, I know some people just jumped on. This is uh, the Andromeda Galaxy we are looking at. It's a naked eye object. Yes. Keep going. <laughs> and so, right. And so, this being the Andromeda Galaxy, we're really being able to pull in a lot of these darker lanes of dust. Um, it's Andromeda Galaxy is, is a wonderful telescope object, but as, as you say, said, Aurora, in a dark location, this is a naked eye object. Yeah. And I believe it has the distinction as the naked eye object that is furthest away from us. Is that, does yes, that sound right? I believe that's yeah. true. Okay. All right. Well, up next, let's do the Crab Nebula. Awesome. Uh, would you like to show where that is found I can do that I well to give you a minute to get your telescope people are wondering how you're controlling it because they see you indoors yes so I have a small telescope sitting or a small telescope <laughs> <laughs> a small computer connected to my telescope on a table in my backyard here in in Oak Hills California mm -hmm. and I am then remote controlled into that so the screen that I'm sharing is actually technically the screen in my other computer. So awesome. by doing that, I'm able to operate that telescope and change where it goes. And then with the plate solving that allows the computer to compare the picture, it'll even make the corrections without me having to eyeball it and make adjustments. Uh, yes. Although if, if I do share my, my screen, uh, just oh, to help give sure. a thorough answer to that question, over on the right of this program, SharpCap, um, then I, I'm actually resetting my settings here. This little area right here are my telescope controls. It actually tells me the coordinates in the night sky, and then it allows me to drive the telescope. So if I wanted to, I could make fine-tune adjustments right here. But my favorite button is looks like that little crosshair that pl that's the cr the plate solve button. I hit that, and the computer does the rest. As long as it's able to see enough stars in one picture. <laughs> All awesome. right, I'll go ahead and stop my share again. Okay, great. Well, let me. Um, I'm going to steal the show while you yes. go find another object. Um, somebody had asked here while I'm zooming this over. Um, somebody had asked, "How do you? Uh, can you see Andromeda clearly?" <laughs> It depends on your seeing conditions. Yes. It depends on you and your eyeballs. And your eyes. Yeah, and, and it also depends on um, uh, on how well you're focused, how much light you're getting. So I don't I, to see anything clearly. I mean, we're talking. Uh, that's what photographs are for. Usually, it'll look yeah. like a blurry, fuzzy thing, and like it'll look like a green cotton ball. <laughs> so that's how you <laughs> yes. know you've got it. <laughs> yeah, yes, indeed. Some of these these objects. Um, for instance, the Horsehead Nebula, which is over in Orion. Yeah. It, when we're looking at those in a telescope, the same question could be asked. Can you see it clearly? Well, that's the type of object where so half the time you're talking yourself into whether or not you could see it. It's like, I think I see it. <laughs> and that could be true with Andromeda. 
By the way, uh, always try to apply averted vision when you're looking for something that's known to be dim. In other words, don't look straight at the object. Look a little bit off to the side, uh, and your, mm -hmm. our eyes are often a little more sensitive because our optic nerve connects right in the back, right? So our, we're a little less sensitive to light. Yeah, so if you want to see detail, point. like if you're looking at the frame of the computer right now, you can still see that I'm waving my hands. Like if you look kind of off to the side, if everybody does that right now, you can still see that I'm kind of moving. Um, so to get more resolution, especially under low power, like uh, low light levels, um, you're going to do that. But if you want to see color, like if you look at the cat's eye, then you're going to look straight at it and that will give you more more detail. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to my screen that I keep threatening to show you. Okay, here we go. Not threatening. That was the wrong word. <laughs> okay, I'm threatening you with astronomy. Okay, so <laughs> what are we looking at again? <laughs> Crab Nebula. Crab M1. Nebula. <laughs> okay, so this one, um, I'm going to put brackets around so you can see it. This is M1. And this is, oh, look at that. Look how perfect that was. Okay, so this is what we're going to be looking at here. This is a star that exploded about a thousand years ago and was recorded by cultures and people across the world as being, I think, um, up. You, uh, those of you who know more historical astronomy than I do, um, you can correct me on this, but I think it was up day and night for two months ish. Um, but it was recorded everywhere except Europe. <laughs> So astronomers in Europe just have no records, and we don't know why. Uh, but this is something that exploded, and this is a star that went, where is it? There we go. Um, a star that ran out of fuel, and it, we can still see those effects many, many, many years later. And so how to find this one is, and I'm sure Brian is going to add a lot more detail than I just gave you. <laughs> so do you see how um, you can see Orion here, the three belt stars? Mm -hmm. We're going to be investigating this in just a minute. This is our last object tonight. So if we can find Orion, actually, if I can interrupt myself even more, look how far out. Here, let me get rid of that for a second. Okay. So if we're facing east, Orion has just popped up over the horizon, just risen. Do you see how there are six stars forming the winter hexagon with Orion's foot being one of them. Do you see that? Okay, so this winter hexagon shows you six different constellations, which we're not going to go over in detail, but you can see the, um, how each one has a bright star inside. Okay, and this is actually not a star. This is a, a, that's a planet. I think it's Mars. Is that Mars? Yeah, that's Mars. So he won't be there tomorrow or next week. Um, he's passing through. So what we're looking for is M1 is inside of this winter hexagon. So if you can find Orion, Orion's kind of pointing towards the center of that hexagon. I wish there was a way in Stellarium to kind of outline this, but there isn't. Um, and then here, I'll put the brackets around it again so you can see it. You can find M1. How do you star hop to M1, Brian? So it usually, I, I do start uh, very similar to what you shared. I would usually go from Orion, especially this time of the year, and then I look up and I look for the V, mm -hmm. the V for Taurus. Yes. And with, with the V from Taurus then, um, what happens is I usually use the, so oftentimes if I'm manually driving a telescope, then I'm using a Telrad, which projects um, when you look through it, you see these red circles appear to be up on the sky. Uh, and so what I do is I use the distance from Aldebaran to the bottom of the V, and then I add it three times out in a straight line from okay. that arm of the V, and then that, that usually puts the crab right in the view. Okay. So, so yeah, I mostly go from Orion, and it kind of makes a, if we follow this oh, yeah. line with the brighter like star one. here, um, with um, Aldebaran or Aldebaran, like intersecting. right here, it kind of makes a line, and you want to know where that line, where that intersection is, and kind of just go up from Orion, and you kind of look in this area here. Um, it doesn't have any bright stars near it, which is what makes it tricky. Yes, but what is nice is if you get in the vicinity um, with the telescope, um, a, a lower magnification, then you can often browse around mm -hmm. and then you find that fuzzy. Yeah. So it has it listed here as a supernova rem remnant. Is yes, indeed. Classified. That is exactly right. Yeah. That's right. So that's a star that we would say tried to fuse iron and the iron said, no, thank you. Yes. And it exploded. <laughs> yes. 
never a good idea when you're a star. <laughs> So, um, okay, let's so see, let's I do have, it, I do have it ready. I'm still uh, fine tuning my settings, but okay. I think we have a, a, a good enough quality to share. Yeah, now this is a much more faint object. And, uh, and so what, what we do have right here is if I show you the native view full screen, so we can see it's this little fuzzy here and what happened and in a telescope, that's what we were expecting is, is a fuzzy. Um, now, what's happening is there's a um, a neutron star at the middle that is also a pulsar, and what that means is it's actually rotating at a very high rate of speed, about every 30 seconds, if I remember right, and it's sending out energy. But what it's doing is it's blasting away at the gas that's left over from when that star exploded, uh, and so. As you start to see more detail, then you start to discern filaments of all those gases that are being blasted away by the, the neutron star that's at the middle. And what I'm working on here is I'm just checking to see if I can color balance this a little bit better. So this is the image without stretching anything. And you notice there's very little detail. So as I start to, by stretch, what that means is it's, it's working with the data the camera has provided to try to, to give us more of that information. And then I can actually bring in the blacks a little bit to help with the contrast. Now it's green because uh, cameras are biased towards green. In other words, they're, they're actually more sensitive in the green area of light, but we can balance that. In post-production, we, we do a lot of color correction, but I have some basic color correction here. So now I've applied that and we're actually being able to make out some of these red filaments. Uh, in, in images that you'll see processed, the Crab Nebula is very red, a lot of high, which is often hydrogen. Whoops. So it's a lot of delicate work. And uh, so, okay, I think I'm satisfied with that. Um, by the way, I there's other calibration that I have to do to take out pixels that are um, that are hot or are actually a defect, one tiny little pixel on the camera. So that's what these little green squiggles and blue squiggles and red squiggles are that you see. <laughs> Those are the little features that are on the camera that I would still need to take out of my of a processed image. So while we're here, I'll give you some uh, some facts on the Crab Nebula. And so this is also called M1. So a, a really good, easy quiz question would be, which Messier object did he document first? Well, <laughs> now you know. It is M1, Messier 1, the Crab Nebula. Now, it was actually discovered by an English doctor named John Bevis back in 1731, but then documented first in Messier's catalog. Uh, quick reminder, Messier was a comet hunter. He was looking for comets, but kept finding other fuzzies getting in his way that did not move across the night sky from night to night. So he started to catalog a collection of objects that might be mistaken for comets in the telescopes of the time. He used that as a list of items not to bother with. We now use it as a list of things to hunt for, <laughs> and namely M1, the Crab Nebula right here. Now, this is uh, believed to be the remnant, as Roy started to mention, of a supernova that was actually documented by the Chinese Japanese and Arab astronomers in 1054. And so we actually then call this uh, the remnant of supernova SN 1054 for the year that it was believed to occur. Um, now, in the night sky, it has a magnitude, an apparent magnitude of 8.4. Um, so it's fairly dim. It's, it's uh, beyond what we would expect to be able to see definitely with our naked eye which I understand is usually about fifth magnitude, but it is far away, 6,500 light years distant from the sun. And it's actually now considered to be about 11 light years in diameter and growing. Scientists estimate that this cloud of gas is expanding at 1,500 kilometers per second. That is fast. 
but it's so far away from us, we're not seeing a drastic change in its angular size. Angular size um, describes how wide it appears to be in the night sky. And let's see, and I mentioned, I mentioned my last little fact here was the neutron star at the center of the nebula. That is known as the Crab Pulsar. And in my notes here, it's uh, emitting all kinds of radiation from gamma rays even into radio waves and it's rotating 30.2 times each second so i think i said 30 seconds so no 30.2 times every second so this is a star huge star that's collapsed into a neutron star that is rotating 30.2 times that's faster than i can rotate and uh, definitely a lot faster than our sun rotates but one final note I'll just give while we're talking about this. If you may wonder, how is it that something that is a, a huge star could rotate that fast? Well, um, the best analogy I've ever heard would be of an ice skater who is spinning around. When the ice skater brings in her arms, you notice that she starts rotating faster. And that's a description of conservation of momentum. So when the star exploded what was left collapsed in but it still had all of its momentum and as it collapsed more it started rotating faster and faster until it's come here to 30.2 times each second all right and that's what i have to say about that awesome okay so let's see i can't hear you at the moment over you can't Zoom. hear me at all really it's really faint I'm really faint. Uh-oh. That can't be good. Let me, I'll go ahead and say while we're working on, on your me hearing your audio. How about this audio? Is that um, better? It's really faint for me. I guess maybe if we could get a report from people on, on uh, YouTube if you're able to hear Aurora. Oh, here, I'll get on screen with you. If you guys can hear me, can you tell me in the chat if my volume is okay? It, it looks perfect here, but did you minimize your volume at all, Brian? No. Okay. She says it sounds fine there. All right. Well, I'll just, uh, I'll turn okay. it up on my side. Who knows? Zoom may have decided to try to adjust it. So. Oh, that's right. You're only hearing me through Zoom. Okay. Um, okay. That's right. I, be I beefed up my volume here. As long as everyone online can, can hear. Yeah. <laughs> then, okay. We're getting, we're yes. I'm perfect. Do you hear that? Look okay, at that. Good. Look at people are saying I'm perfect. You're perfect. We're good. done. <laughs> the, the, the survey is in. You're perfect. <laughs> All right, I had to look up where India was, by the way. I wasn't sure if the equator oh. went through it or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and apparently they have an equatorial aversion. Did you know that of sky maps? They have northern and southern, and they also have equatorial. Oh, yes. Actually, Didn't when um, I, I recently went on a cruise that oh, yeah, right. um, dipped down into, you know, into southern Mexico, and I actually found that the that equatorial map was the one that worked best because the southern hemisphere was way too low. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, oh, um, so, uh, paper map here. Um, let's yes, see. that's right. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop quick. my share. Now, Ooh, I'm going to go don't... after one other object. Yeah, we only have one left, and this one's super easy to find. Yes, uh, as long as my house isn't in the way. <laughs> so we will, we will check All this right. Out. So here, why don't you go find that one while I do this? Yes. Okay, so um, I can actually outline the, the hexagon here. So there's Mars that we don't want to highlight. So we, we see a whole bunch of bright stars. And that would and be the winter hexagon? There's my winter, oh, what did I say? Just hexagon. Oh, I just said, I'm sorry, winter hexagon, yep. And so not all of it is above yet, but we've got most of it. And here's Orion. And so, um, let's see, you were saying that you looked for the V here on Taurus. This is the eye of the bull, right? It's a nice big red star, which is fantastic. And then we're just gonna go, we're gonna extend that line for that, that um, Aldebaran is on. Extend that line. And then you're gonna hit M1, and M1 is right above the head of Orion here. So this is M1 right in there. Okay. And so, which now has marks all over it. So here, here's M1 in orange. Okay, and then we can even zoom in a little. Look at that, look at that zoom action right there. Okay, so that's where you're gonna be looking. And this last object he's gonna look at is, are you gonna look at the um, M42, O'Brien, or are you gonna go for Yes, it? M42 is what I'm after. Okay, so M42 is right here. 
And this one is super easy to find. You just find the three belt stars and then you drop down to find the three st stars in the sword. And then if we look at that middle star, let me move this over to my screen. Okay, you see where the Big Dipper is? The Big Dipper, listen to me. <laughs> I need, uh, okay, <clears throat> let me try this again. Do you see where Orion is? <laughs> okay, so the three belt stars and you drop down and there are three really bright, well, depending on how good your eyes are, um, stars in the sword. The middle one is right where we're going for. And this is the object we are looking at. And it, this is the horse head, which he had mentioned before, which is right up here by one of the belt stars. There's a lot of good stuff to look at in here. And so this is where Brian's gonna be. So again, here is Orion and three belt stars. You're gonna look in here to kind of review real quick. Here's the V from Taurus and you're gonna go straight this way. Okay, and look in this area for M1. The other object was Cassiopeia, which is here. Do you see Cassiopeia is the W? Okay, take the bigger triangle and you're going to, it's pointing up towards a bright star. You're gonna go one, two, three. Here's Andromeda, remember that, Andromeda. And I, I think we went over the other one a couple of times, so that should be good. All right, Brian, you ready to take it away? Or, you, or should I keep talking? I've, I've centered my telescope, it is available. Uh, okay. And so I'm just capturing my first uh, 30 second image. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. So, um, so just... um, telescope questions people are asking, yeah. actually binocular questions people are asking, good binoculars for adults and kids. Um, but uh, so this is email questions. So I like these because they're $30 and I'm not going to freak out if my kids drop them. <laughs> so um, these are Celestron Cometrons. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to have kids look at the moon first, obviously not the sun. Um, never look at the sun through anything with lenses. That's usually the, the stand, standing rule. Um, but look at the moon, it's amazing. During the day, you can look at um, things like uh, trees and so forth, um, and you'll learn how you look. So for me, I always aim them a little too low, so this is good information. So when I look, I usually just have to bump it up a little bit, and then I know I'm, uh, I'm on. And so those are great. Um, my favorite for binoculars for grownups, I haven't used a lot of them. My two favorites are um, the seven by 100s. I'm sorry, this, no, no, the 10 by 50s. I'm sorry, the 10 by 50s uh, by Orion called uh, Ultra Views. And then my giant binoculars, <laughs> which is made by Uberwork, are 25 by 100s. But really, you can just borrow binoculars. You don't, don't feel like you have to go out and buy stuff. Um, so you can just borrow binoculars. Everybody's got a pair somewhere. You, you probably know people that have some and you could just borrow them and see if you like them. All right, you tell me when you're right. ready. I'm, I'm gonna stop I'm talking when you're I'll ready. I'll go ahead and share my screen. You're ready, okay, hang so on. So <laughs> everyone get ready, drum roll please. Drum the roll, Simba Crash. Nebula in Orion. <laughs> All right, wow. here it is. <clears throat> now, um, j I have a, a star that is freaking out my lens, so ignore that little arc right there. <laughs> And then I have a couple of satellites that have gone through already. That's what these two little lines are. But this is the Great Nebula in Orion. Um, but definitely my favorite object in the night sky. And now the this this nebula is actually about 1,350 light years away and about 2 million years old, according to NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, and this is considered a stellar nursery. In other words, stars right now are being born here in this region. Now, um, blown out in the center, you can see how this glow is, is super drastic here. There's a collection of four bright stars in an open cluster called the trapezium. And I can see if I can back out my... Um, magnificate or my uh, stretching here to see if I could bring them out. Um, it requires, yeah, so here they are right here. See those four stars? I'll, I'll uh, let me bring up the dark a little bit. So those four stars are actually um, in a special arrangement. These are fun to see in binoculars, uh, or I should say really more telescope. The nebula itself, you can absolutely see in binoculars, but whether or not you can make out those four stars depends on the conditions. This has been my experience. But these four stars in the trapezium, they're actually belting out a tremendous amount of ultraviolet light. And they've actually carved through 
the gases of which these stars have formed and blasted out an opening. Fortunately, that opening is facing us and allows us to see inside in order to see these objects. So trapezium is a really fun object to look at through this, but of course there's just endless uh, streams and filaments of gas going off in all different directions. And as you can see, another case, we've got lots of red. A lot of this red would be hydrogen. And again, something too where in, in larger telescopes, I've also seen color in, in the Orion Nebula as well. Okay, so that I'm going to see if I can frame in as much as possible. This is my full view um, of, the, uh, of the nebula. Here. So that's the most that with the with that telescope that I can show in one view. Any other questions coming in at all? A couple more email questions. Um, okay, great. Well, look at that. It's actually right here at the hour mark. It is. Not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> we did right. it. We made it through the we whole did. thing. <laughs> yes. All right. I'll go ahead and stop my share. And I'm glad it's a perfect amount of time. Uh, Orion is. just cleared my house. <laughs> so <laughs> we were able to get a nice picture of that. That's Yay! A good one to end with, well, I thank think. you so much, Brian. Um, we oh, have a couple pleasure. of quick quick questions. Um, people were asking, uh, where, oh, so we get the this thing from skymaps.com. It's free. And so we like that. Um, you can download yes. where, if you live north of the equator, you get in the northern hemisphere. Now I know if you live on the equator <laughs> or somewhere and around the equator, you can get the equatorial absolutely. version. Absolutely. And the southern equator. Um, the, <laughs> the two galaxies that you can see from the southern hemisphere are, I have not seen them myself. I don't know if you have, Brian, the large and small Magellanic clouds. Those are naked. I have not been far enough south to see them. Yeah, so I no. haven't either. So those are the two. If you live in the southern hemisphere, you guys get two. We only get yes. one up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and other questions. When is Kent coming back? Um, Kent will be, uh, he actually has been at the live stargazing events. And what was really cool, he said, is that people recognized his voice. And he thought that was so cool. <laughs> and so yes. he couldn't be with us tonight, but um, he was definitely, uh, he was sad to miss us, but um, he's gonna be joining us again soon. Um, yes, we definitely. actually have another stargazing event coming up. We are continuing to be in person every month at the uh, Santa Margarita Lake. And you're always welcome. They're public stargazing events. You can find out more from our website, uh, centralcoastastronomy.org. Brian, if you wanna drop that um, our website in that would probably be useful. Sure, I'd be happy to. I, I would like to mention that yeah. at the moment we don't have the 2023 dates out yet. Oh, right. So the calendar doesn't show any, but you right. definitely check our website, keep your eye on it, yeah. and so you could subscribe to our email list mm -hmm. uh, to have the latest information on what we're up to. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we don't have anything on the calendar. We're still working it out for next year, but know that we will be doing stargazing on a regular basis live. Yes. And then mm -hmm. um, the next one uh, for us here, um, we'll post it on the website as well as soon as we have those dates mm -hmm. ready for you. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. And um, we yeah. we had a, a question come in if we have time for another. Yeah, go ahead. Another question. So um, we, we had the question come in, why do some star maps look like an orange peel? And the reason is, uh, when we look up on the night sky, you can really think of it as we're in the middle of a sphere looking out. And I know, Rory, you've got uh, globes behind you as well. Yeah. And if you ever look at a globe, then th the, uh, the layers are actually in little orange peels, just like with mm -hmm. peeling an orange. And it all has to do with a term called projection. In other words, how do they make the stars appear when they're documenting them down on a flat piece of paper? And so in order to be accurate, they can only show a short amount um, in, in any one picture. Otherwise, this, the distances between the stars are drastically different. Mm -hmm. So in order to be super accurate, then they'll project it in the orange peel. And the idea is if you put the two pieces together, then that would show their relation. Mm -hmm. With the sky maps, what they do is they project it as if you're rolling it along the horizon as you go. And it takes some practice to, to imagine and the best ways to get outside with a red flashlight and just start using it. And eventually you won't even need that anymore. You'll just start to memorize anything. But remember, you have to work an entire year to see all the stars that are possible from your location. 
uh, because that darn earth keeps spinning around the sun. And so sometimes stuff is up during the day. So I hope that helps answer the orange peel question. Yeah. Yeah, doing, um, making things, something round turn into something flat. If you've ever peeled an orange, you know you can't get it. Even if you get it off on one peel, you can't make it flat. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't look like a piece of paper. So yeah, right. creative ways of solving awesome. all kinds of problems. Yes. <laughs> Don't even get us started yeah. on the calendar. Okay, oh, so. Man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, other questions? Um, I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, if you would like to tell us, if you have a telescope, we'd love to know. You can type it in. What is your favorite thing to look at? It, it, whether you're look, looking at with your naked eyeballs or what it is. If you don't have a telescope, that's okay. What's your favorite thing to look at? We would love to know that. You can drop it in the chat. We've had so much fun being with you tonight. It's, um, it's really our pleasure to spend some time with you and just really inspire you to get out there. The best way to get um, familiar with the night sky, because you look outside, you go look up and you're like, ah, I'm overwhelmed already. <laughs> <laughs> it's to just practice. Just Even if you just take one of the things that we talked about tonight, whichever one's easiest for you, do that. And then every night, just add a little bit more, a little bit more. And so, so what some people have done is they will take our presentations, especially the one was with Kent, um, and then they will just have it on audio. They'll watch it first, and then they'll have it on audio, and they'll go outside and then look up just like we were demonstrating in class, and they'll, they'll have it that way. Um, so that, that can be um, helpful as well. Okay, and <laughs> thank you. Thank you, James. It's good to see you. <laughs> I haven't seen you in ages. I owe you a great big hug when I see you. All right, so <laughs> um, other questions that are coming in? I think, I think we got most of it. So, I think we're good. Brian, if you have anything yeah. else you wanted to share, otherwise I think we will we'll no, wrap things yeah, up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone. This is a, a great, great time we had together. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next okay, time. Thanks. Get outside Bye. and go look up. Bye-bye. <laughs>